Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Atkinson, but you can call me Dr. A. Welcome to CS 5914, where we are diving into the realm of artificial tools, artificial intelligence tools in software development. Trust me folks, there are gonna be some mind blowing things we can achieve by harnessing the power of artificial intelligence to make writing software a whole lot easier than it is today. In this course, we'll explore how AI tools can enhance almost every core activity of software engineering. Plus, we'll uncover how the latest AI advancements can be used to integrate awesome features into software products. Now, let me tell you, I'm absolutely pumped to share these game-changing concepts with all of you. Why? Because you folks are the ones heading out into the real world and you're embarking on careers in software technology and let me tell you, understanding how artificial intelligence is transforming software development is going to be crucial for anyone trying to code and build software in the next couple of years. So let's not waste any more time. I'm eager to dive into some exciting perspectives, new processes, and reasons why I'm super thrilled to bring these technological ideas to you all. So get ready students, because we're about to embark on an epic journey into the world of AI in software development. All right, folks. <coughs> All right, folks, here's the big idea behind this course. Brace yourselves. Natural language has become the new programming language. Yeah, you heard me right. We can now have direct conversations with highly knowledgeable assistants and we can utilize their outputs to generate software systems. It's like our mouths and fingertips have become the starting point for the compiler to do its magic. So let's talk about using AI to build software. It's kind of like riding a bike. It helps you reach your destination faster, but it can still be risky if you're not careful. So just like with any new technology, we need to exercise caution. It's possible to see how this technology could be used to write malicious software, and it can certainly at the same time make it very much easier for people to learn how to launch attacks on software systems. So while the idea of English becoming a programming language is super exciting, we will also consider the potential negative impacts on society. We have to be aware that if this technology is misused, it could cause some serious harm. That's why towards the end of the course, once we've grasped the capabilities of this technology, we'll delve into discussions about bias and the societal effects that the technology might have. So buckle up because we're diving into the realm where natural language meets programming. And just remember with great power comes great responsibility. Sorry, I couldn't help that. And we're going to explore it all. So here we go. The technologies we're about to dive into are kind of like the figure of thousand monkeys on a thousand keyboards. They can lend us a helping hand in writing software, but let's face it, sometimes those monkeys don't quite hit the mark. And that's where us humans step in. It's our job to carefully review the generated code and assemble the approved pieces into larger software systems. So in the next slides, we'll walk through an example of how we can utilize our monkey assistants to write a Python program for a classic puzzle game called Towers of Hanoi. But folks, we need to exercise caution because as you'll see, our monkey friends do not always get it right. All right, let's jump in and see how this whole thing works. Now, it might seem a little odd to kick off our discussion on artificial intelligence and software development by diving into a puzzle that was actually invented way back in 1883 by a French mathematician named Edward Luca. Yes, uh, I'm talking about Towers of Hanoi. This puzzle has some specific rules, so let me quickly run through them. So the puzzle begins with discs arranged in a conical shape, and the goal is to move all the discs from the first pole to the third pole, keeping them in the same order. But here's the catch. You can only move the topmost disc at a time. You're not allowed to place a larger disc onto a smaller one either. So no picking up discs from the middle. So you might be wondering, why on earth are we talking about this ancient puzzle? 
Well, here's the deal. I'm going to ask ChatGPT, our trusty open API chatbot, to help us write a Python program that allows us to play this game interactively. My ultimate aim is to have a Python program that we can run on the command line and enjoy some Towers of Hanoi action. See, what I really want to demonstrate here is how quickly we can generate interesting code using ChatGPT. The speed at which we can do this is pretty darn fascinating. And you know what else? It's intriguing to see how accurate the generated code turns out to be as we go through the example. Now, I won't show you every single step. I'm going to summarize some of them. But fear not, I'll make the final code available for download. So if any of you fine folks are interested, just give me a shout out on Piazza. So without any more delays, let's dive right in and see how I collaborated with ChatGPT to construct a Python program for us to play the Towers of Hanoi. Get ready for some fun coding, folks. Okay, so now the first step is to ask our good old friend OpenAI's ChatGPT program to give us a concise rundown of the rules for the Towers of Hanoi. I'm using the latest and greatest GPT model here, GPT-4, to ensure that we're getting the best possible project and code generation. So this means our AI buddy should be well aware of the rules that we just covered in the previous slide. So I tell it, hey, let's utilize those rules and represent the game state in Python using lists. So in Python, just like in most programming language, we have a concept called lists. It's a data structure. And in Python, they're denoted by square brackets and the elements inside are separated by commas. Don't worry too much about the nitty gritty Python details yet, just yet. The main point here is we want to represent the game state as a list of lists. Each inner list will represent the disks on one rod and the disks are labeled D1, D2, D3 and so on, where D1 is smaller than D2, which is smaller than D3. And guess what? ChatGPT generates that code for us. Fantastic. We now have a starting representation for the game state. So, all right, let's continue our collaboration with ChatGPT. We'll explore how it can assist us in building an interactive program that actually plays the game with us. So buckle up as we dive deeper into this exciting journey. In this top conversation here, I requested ChatGPT to write a read eval print loop called a REPL to play the game, which essentially means asking for a command line version of the game. So I specified that I wanted the program to take input on the command line in the form of moves, where a move consists of selecting a disk from a rod and specifying a destination rod. ChatGPT generated some initial code for me, but it didn't implement the rule about this sizes correctly. It initially allowed any disk to be placed on top of any other disk. So we had to instruct it to implement the rule regarding disk size. Next, ChatGPT wanted to generate a list representation where the rightmost element represented the topmost disk on the rod. However, I disagreed with that approach and for just for readability, preferred the leftmost element to represent the topmost disk. I also pointed out that it generated the initial state incorrectly. So even after fixing the code for disk removal, in other words, leftmost, the initial state remained incorrect. So ChatGPT apologized for the confusion and provided the corrected initial state. Unfortunately, there was no rule in place still to, present, to prevent selecting a disk from the middle of a rod. So I had to explicitly specify that only the topmost, or i.e. leftmost disk, should be moved from a rod. So ChatGPT made the necessary adjustments accordingly. Then finally, I realized that the program didn't have a way of determining if the game had been won. So I asked ChatGPT to add a function to check if the game had been won, but initially it got it wrong. However, it acknowledged the mistake once I pointed it out and provided a new function to address the issue. So it's important to note a few things about this interaction. So while ChatGPT did generate code and make fix-ups along the way, it didn't apply those fix-ups to certain aspects such as the initial state and the game is one function. 
So these needed to be explicitly instructed and added over time. And the generated code wasn't a complete and perfect solution out of the box. So furthermore, as these natural language tools and chat spots improve in code generation, we'll be able to work with them at a higher level and place more trust in the code they create. But it's essential to keep in mind that you'll still need to update and assemble the generated code separately in a Python code editor, as I did in this case. So without further ado, let's take a summary, a look at a summary of what the final code looks like. So as you can see, I've captured the code here in a main procedure in Python. In Python, procedures start with a def, or in other words, short for definition, followed by the name of the function in parentheses and a colon. You'll get used to Python's use of colons as they separate declarations from implementations, and they're also involved in if statements, as we can see here as well. So I've expanded all the code to fit on one slide. Um, well, I should say I've folded some of the code so that it all fits on one slide as it grew a little bit larger when working with ChatGPT. So let's take a closer look at what we have. We start with a main method which serves as the entry point. We define an initial game state as we discussed earlier. Then we have various methods. Get disk and rod is responsible for capturing a disk description and finding its location on a rod. Is move legal checks if a given disk can be moved onto a specific destination rod. Is game one examines the game state to determine if the game has been won. And print game state simply prints the game state on the screen. So we begin by printing the initial game state and enter an infinite loop. So in each iteration of the loop, we first check to see if the game has been won. Initially, it won't have been won, so we proceed. We then ask for a move, which involves the user identifying a disk and the destination rod. So we find the disk in its current rod position, ensuring that the selected disk is the topmost disk on the rod. And that's checked using the source rod property from the find disk on rod method. So if the source rod is none, that means it's there's an attempt to pick from the middle or to pick, yeah, to pick from the middle of a stack of disks. So we simply print the message and loop back to the start. If the move is legal from the source disk to the destination rod, we remove the disk from the source rod and insert it into the left-hand side of the destination rod or the top of the destination rod, if you like. If the move is not legal though, we print an error message, print the game state, and ask for another move. So in summary, it's interesting to observe that while ChatGPT generates the initial skeleton of this code, we have to assemble and refine it based on the fixes and refinements we applied. It's up to us to maintain a cohesive version of the code that aligns with what we're looking for. So there you have it, a summary of the code we developed through collaboration with ChatGPT. It's a testament to how we can leverage natural language tools and chatbots to assist us in building our programs. So let's delve into what we just learned about constructing a Python program for Towers of Hanoi and explore how we can generalize this process. But before we do that, we need to familiarize ourselves with a few new terms that have been mentioned on the previous slide. So first off, the acronym GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. It's called Generative because it generates text. It's called Pre-trained because OpenAI's GPT models have been pre-trained on a massive collection of documents. And Transformer refers to the underlying architecture that enables it to understand text and use that understanding to generate response text in a statistically driven manner. So how can we leverage all this technology to write code more efficiently? Well, using AI-generated code chunks, like the ones produced by ChatGPT, they can take away the drudgery of solving the smaller problems and prevent losing sight of the bigger picture. Uh, it generated methods to detect fine disks and so on and so forth. We can concentrate on playing the game. So it's an innovative approach to software construction. Think of it as compiling English into code. You can ask ChatGP to construct custom code components and put them together like Lego blocks that are specifically designed for your problem domain. However, software engineer humans will still be needed to assemble these components together. So in this diagram, I aim to illustrate how starting with a prompt, in other words, a piece of English, a request, like 
please write the Towers of Hanoi in Python as a REPL. And by engaging in iterative conversations with ChatGPT, all of that can lead to the assembly of code, the creation of a Python application such as the Towers of Hanoi. Moving forward, we'll explore ways to improve this process, but I want to emphasize that this represents a fundamental new approach to building, teaching, and learning software development. Previously, humans were solely responsible for step four in the diagram, but now we can harness the power of AI generators to demand the best possible code components, and we can ensure desirable properties in the final program, all while doing less work ourselves. And remember, we'll also explore how AI can assist in various other aspects of software development beyond coding. All right, so get ready for an exciting journey where we embrace this new technology and enhance our software development skills. One final uh, note on the introduction here. It's not just about knowing how to generate software components. It's equally important to understand which software principles to apply and in what order to create a solid application. This is akin to having a well thought out plan coupled with a dose of experience to formulate an effective strategy. So we can use this plan to piece together our code and we can even try to teach parts of the plan to AI tools to enhance their usefulness. So as we assemble our system, we need to become more acquainted with practical principles that guide our decision making. So when it comes to starting out as a junior engineer, things can become a bit more challenging. As a junior engineer, you may not be familiar with engineering principles and lack the benefit of extensive experience. So with an emphasis on upfront planning and system assembly, quality planning takes on a greater significance. So to achieve the best and fastest results, we do need to employ the best plans. So in this course, as we develop various software systems in Python, I'll make a concerted effort to highlight the importance of planning at every opportunity. We'll discuss high level, arch high level architecture considerations, and we'll delve also into the small yet impactful principles that yield long-term benefits. So get ready to embark on a journey where we not only focus on assembling code, but also prioritize effective planning. Together, we'll enhance our understanding of software engineering principles, and we'll equip ourselves with the tools to develop high quality systems. So let's dive right in.